Hi friends and welcome to our unit on kinetics, thermodynamics, and equilibrium. We're going to talk about all of those things, but before we do, let's go and take a look at the overall organization of the course and see where we are in the grand scheme of our chemistry year. So as a reminder, our theme for the year is that matter is made of atoms that interact in interesting ways. And we've been dealing with that from the beginning. We're going to continue to deal with it through the end. Our course is basically broken up into four major sections. Our first section dealt with the behavior of large amounts of matter. Our second section dealt with an investigation of the atom itself and the internal structure of the atom. And our third section of the course has dealt with the interactions between different groups of atoms. We learned about them first in the periodic table and learned how chemical bonds were made. Then we learned about the rules that govern how we put together compounds of different atoms. And our last unit dealt with the behavior of different compounds interacting with each other through chemical reactions. This unit, kinetics and equilibrium, is really going to deal with what happens with energy over the course of chemical reactions. So now that we know that reactants go to products, we want to take a look inside of the arrow to see what's happening to the energy of the system and the substances that are participating in the reaction. Does this make sense? Sound good? Cool. Let's go back to the lesson. So we're going to start at the beginning, which is really how do substances react with each other? And we're going to talk about what's called the collision theory of chemical reactions. So what causes a chemical reaction? We know that it involves reactants going to products, but what happens to those reactants that gets them to react? The study of this is what's known as kinetics, which is the study of the energy changes that happen over the course of a chemical reaction. And what kinetics is really interested in is figuring out the reaction mechanisms, how a reaction happens. So to look at our example of the lit match, one of the major reactions that happens over the course of a match lighting is an exothermic reaction between phosphorus and potassium chlorate to produce potassium chloride and P4O10. This is actually the one of the major initial reactions when you first strike the match. So let's put on our atomic level imagination glasses and go in and think about what's happening when these two reactants are coming into contact with each other. So let's go and look at a simulation first. So what we have here is a single molecule of a compound represented as a blue and purple sphere in the middle of a reaction chamber. And we can fire another reactant at that initial reactant and see what happens when they hit each other. Of course, in order to react with each other, they do have to come into physical contact. They have to collide. So let's look at this first collision and see what happens. You can see the amount of energy I give the reactants on the right hand side. Wow, it's kind of boring, isn't it? There's no reaction happening. So it's not enough just to collide. You also have to collide with enough energy. Let's try this again and give it a little bit more energy. You can see we loaded it up, we'll let it go, and there's the reaction. You can see the reaction happening when the two reactant molecules collide with each other, a bond is broken, and a new bond is made. So it's not just enough to collide, but you have to have enough energy when you collide in order for a bond to be broken and a new one to be made. The other thing that's really important is the orientation of the reactant molecules. So let's look at this simulation again, but now let's change the angle at which the two reactants hit each other. Let's give it plenty of energy and see what happens. So there it goes, maxed out in energy, and here's a glancing blow, and you can see that we do not get a reaction as a result because the orientation was not correct. We didn't hit it dead on like we did in our second example. And so as a result, when these two molecules hit each other, and there they go again, we don't get a reaction. So to summarize, it's not just enough for two reactants to collide with each other. When they collide with each other, they have to collide with the correct energy and orientation. We call collisions that lead to reactions effective collisions. And the more effective collisions we have in a sample of a substance, the more chemical reactions will occur. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we move on. The study of reaction mechanisms is actually very, very complex. What actually happens when the atoms are reacting with each other? We don't really need to focus on that for this class. Here's a particularly easy example just to get a handle on it. If we combine two HI molecules effectively, they're going to enter a state called the transition state where pre-existing bonds are being broken and new ones are being made. And that's what leads to the production of product molecules. There are different pathways that molecules can take. Here we see two different reaction pathways that are dependent upon the local conditions, in this case, the presence or absence of something called a catalyst. You can see that the uncatalyzed pathway 
is a little bit simpler than the catalyzed pathway, but the catalyzed pathway happens at a lower energy. In order to figure out reaction pathways, you need to do direct experimentation upon the different substances and the intermediates that are produced. It's not something that we really are going to focus on here in our level of chemistry, but it is very cool. And if it's something that you're interested in, it's definitely the kind of thing that'll be discussed at the AP level in a couple of years. The only thing I want you to focus on when we talk about reaction pathways is what's called the rate determining step. If we think about a reaction pathway as having multiple steps, the slowest step is the one that's going to determine the overall rate of the reaction. The second part of this lesson is going to focus on factors that affect the rate of a reaction. Once we get reactants effectively colliding, how can we increase the number of effective collisions that are occurring in a particular unit of time? That's what we call the reaction rate. How many reactions happen in a particular unit of time? It is not how fast or how slow the reaction is happening. For our purpose, reactions are happening in instantaneous time frames. We don't need to worry about the time frame for a particular reaction to occur. We're going to be more interested in how many reactions are happening in a large sample of a substance over a particular unit of time. In order to affect the reaction rate, we can do that in two ways. We can change the number of collisions between the reactants, which will lead to a change in the number of effective collisions, or we can change the reaction mechanism, provide a new pathway for the reaction to occur over. Let's go in and look at different mechanisms that affect reaction rate through these two major pathways. Our first example is changing the nature of the reactant. Different phases of substances and different bond types and substances are going to affect how many reactions can happen in a particular period of time. A good example of this are double replacement reactions like we talked about in our last unit. In a double replacement reaction, the substances had to be dissolved in water in order for the ionic bonds in our precipitate to form. Without those substances being dissolved in water, we really wouldn't get very much of the double replacement reaction happening at all. So by being dissolved in water, the reactions happen considerably faster. This is actually true of most of the chemistry in your body as well. The chemistry is a solution-based chemistry. The substances have to be dissolved and surrounded by water molecules in order for the reactions to happen at the energies and rates that are typical of living things. So the nature of the reactants has a huge effect on the rate of different chemical reactions. The second mechanism that we'll look at that affects reaction rate is by changing the temperature. It's probably pretty obvious to you why changing the temperature changes the reaction rate. We saw it in our little simulation demos before. The hotter the substance, the more average kinetic energy we give the molecules. As the kinetic energy in our sample of our substance increases, the particles will collide more. And as a result, there'll be more collisions and more effective collisions. We can see this when we cook food. So here's a raw egg. And we know that in order to turn the egg into something like this, we have to add a considerable amount of heat to it. That causes the reactions that take place over the cooking process to occur at a much faster rate than would happen if we just left the egg out at ambient temperature. It would happen at a negligible rate. Our third effect is in changing the concentration of the substance. A higher concentration means more of a substance per unit of area. We'll talk a lot more about this going forward in this course, but this is a good time to start to get a handle on this notion. If we have more substance present, there's going to be more collisions between the substance and any other substance in our reaction system. So as a result, there'll be more effective collisions. You should also be aware that for gases, if you change the pressure, that has the same effect as changing the concentration because it changes the volume of the substance. So increasing the pressure forces more molecules into a smaller space. It's exactly the same thing as increasing the concentration. But again, that only works for gases. Here's our example for changing concentration. This is concentrated sulfuric acid. And you can see that the addition of concentrated sulfuric acid to this paper towel leads to an instant charring and oxidation of the paper, almost as if the paper was being lit on fire. That's because the concentration of the sulfuric acid molecules is so high that this reaction can happen very, very fast, leading to what you see here. If the sulfuric acid was at a lower concentration, like the concentrations that we'll deal with when we deal with acids and bases in our class, you could get it on your hand and you wouldn't be in any immediate danger of really feeling much of anything. You'd have enough time to walk over to the sink and calmly wash your hand well before you'd start to feel any sort of burning and certainly your skin would not char. That difference is due to the difference in the concentration of the acid. Another major way that we can affect the rate of collisions is in changing the surface area of our substance. A higher surface area in our reactants means that there's more of the atoms exposed to react with each other. More atoms exposed to react will lead to more effective collisions. 
A good example of this are powdered reactants versus large chunks. What you see here is a picture of just powdered flour, which I'm sure you're very familiar with and is not really anything that you ever think is particularly dangerous. However, if you spread that powder into the air and then you light a match, you can get something like this. This is actually a huge problem in bakeries in the early part of the 20th century. As industrialization started to take over the processes, more and more flour was being powdered and put into the air. And so there were many, many bakery fires that came about as a result of just having too much particulate matter in the atmosphere. The surface area of that particulate matter in the atmosphere was high enough so that when a spark was introduced into the environment, all of that powder would just ignite and explode all at once. Incredibly, incredibly dangerous. That's the effect of changing the surface area on the rate of the reaction. Two factors that can affect the reaction pathway or the reaction mechanism would be the use of a catalyst or the use of an inhibitor. An inhibitor is something that prevents the reactants from effectively colliding. A good example of this is painting of a bridge. If you've ever noticed with large steel structures, they frequently have to paint them. And that's not just to make them look better, it's actually to decrease the amount of rusting that occurs. Rusting occurs as the iron in the bridge comes into contact with the corrosive atmosphere. And so by preventing that, by putting a layer of paint in between the iron and the atmosphere, you greatly decrease the rate of oxidation, the rate of rusting on the bridge. The opposite of an inhibitor is a catalyst. A catalyst is going to increase the reaction rate by providing a different reaction mechanism that lowers the energy necessary for the reaction to occur. And so as a result, increases the rate of the reaction. The catalyst is also going to remain unused in that reaction. It doesn't participate. It just makes the reaction happen over that different pathway. A good example of this are the biological enzymes in your body that are working right now in order to keep you alive. All of the chemical reactions that take place in your body are enzyme catalyzed reactions. Without the enzymes present in your cells, the reaction pathways in your body would require considerably more energy input, which would actually raise the temperature of your body well above the point where you could remain alive. So by having all of these enzymes present, you provide alternative reaction pathways that greatly lower the amount of energy you need to put in, and as a result, enable you to function at a normal biological temperature. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we wrap up. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of collision theory of reactants and how we affect the rate of a reaction. Make sure you can do the following. Make sure that you can use collision theory to explain why a reaction will or will not occur when reactants come into contact with each other. Also make sure that you can analyze the factors that affect reaction rates to determine how to increase or decrease the rate of a particular reaction. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave them in the comments below the video and you can always get in touch with me. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.